Okay, hi there and uh, welcome to a special exam technique video on developing your diagrams. Well, developing your diagrams is an important way to improve your analysis marks in economics papers. Examiners pay special attention to diagrams and the best ones can, uh, can lift an exam script to a very high level despite the pressure of the clock. So practice your diagrams as often as you can in the, the current revision phase. It'll certainly make a big difference. So in this video, I want to, to look at four examples, uh, two each from micro and macro, where you can develop your diagrams to really good effect and claim the highest marks for analysis. Quick reminder that examiners in 2020 are looking for significantly improved diagrams. This is something they've pinpointed in the exam reports. Diagrams should be ace Always remember to label the axes, the curves, and all of the equilibrium points draw to the axes. You also remember, need to remember to be A, B, C with your diagrams. Be accurate, be big, and be clear. Crucial point, simply drawing a diagram from memory, just dumping a diagram onto the page, will only probably get you the lowest level of marks, A01. To access the highest skill marks, for analysis and to help the evaluation, you'll definitely need to make a change or adapt your diagram. Shifting curves, indicating important areas, develop your diagrams. And that's what we're going to do in this video. I'll produce a second one with some more examples uh, in a short while. OK, we're going to take a look at four examples of how you can develop your diagrams to get higher analysis marks. The first one is to use ADAS analysis to think about the impact of a currency depreciation, a fall in the value of a currency. Of course, we're going to be using an aggregate demand and supply framework, general price level on the y-axis, and real national output, real GDP on the x-axis. Let's think about an equilibrium level of GDP at uh, Y1 with a price level of GPL1. Uh, basic analysis is that a currency depreciation uh, improves the price competitiveness of exports, makes them cheaper when priced in a foreign currency. And an increase in the value of exports leads to an outward shift of aggregate demand, leading to an expansion of aggregate supply and increase in real national output, and perhaps the risk of an increase in consumer prices. Now, that's a solid, safe, accurate diagram showing the impact of, a, of currency depreciation on the demand side of the economy. How can you develop the diagram to get better analysis marks? Well, uh, to develop it, Think about the impact of a currency depreciation on aggregate supply because a fall in the external value of the currency increases the prices of imported goods and services such as imported fuel, energy, component parts. And that leads to an inward shift of aggregate supply, an increase in cost push inflation, which of course in theory then leads to slower growth and an equilibrium real output at Y3 instead of Y2. So that's what I would call a developed diagram higher level analysis because it suggests that the currency depreciation can have an impact on both aggregate demand and also aggregate supply. You could take it further, you could develop it to include an estimated potential output, YP, along an aggregate supply, and that would allow you perhaps to think about the importance of the output gap. So a depreciation of the exchange rate when an economy already has a positive output gap could lead to higher inflation, demand pull and cost push inflation. In my diagram here, Potential output lies to the right, so the economy is operating within its potential. That could, in fact, reduce the inflationary consequences of, of an exchange rate depreciation. So what are we doing here? We're taking a simple diagram and we're developing it in some way, shifting curves, thinking about the wider effects. My second example is a very common curve that's often just dumped into an essay, the so-called Laffer curve, the, the supposed relationship between the tax rate and the total tax revenue a government might get. I don't necessarily draw my Laffer curve uh, to the zero points. You don't have to. The key idea behind the Laffer curve is that uh, if we uh, increase the tax rate from T1 to T2, we might actually end up with less tax revenue. So that's a sort of hinting that lower tax rates could actually increase the tax revenue to the government. Well, this is a very common curve. It's undeveloped. Okay, you've drawn two tax rates and two revenues, but it's not really developed curve. 
My, my idea here would be to think about the wider impact of other policies. So, for example, if, if the government introduces some tough tax avoidance policies, um, you know, much tougher taxation, uh, attacking, for example, shadow pricing, other forms of legal tax avoidance by companies in particular, that could shift the Laffer curve up. You can, in other words, you could have a higher level of tax revenue at T1. And even if you increase the tax rate from T1 to T2, if you've got better tax avoidance policies, you could end up with a higher level of tax revenue, R3. Tough tax avoidance measures can lift the tax revenue at each level of income and tax rates. That's what I call a developed diagram. It's taking a simple idea and just taking it one stage further to develop your analysis. Uh, two examples now on the micro side. Again, two relatively common questions and topical questions. At the moment, there is a lot of interest in the idea of introducing some form of housing rent control, some sort of maximum price on renting. On the left hand side, I'll put together a nice simple rent control diagram. Here's the free market average rent, if you like, in a, in a city or a town. It's the free market rent, of course, to have any effect on the market. You have to set the, the capped rent below it. Let's put in a rent control which lies below. Uh, the consequence, of course, being that the supply of rented property contracts to Q1, demand expands to Q2, and you create an excess demand in the market. That will be a, a diagram which is perfectly fine. It shows the impact of a rent control, but it's not developed. The student hasn't taken the analysis further using the diagram. It's a fairly simple, basic rent control diagram. On the right hand side, let me just show you what I mean What I mean by a developed diagram. One thing you could do, of course, is to change the elasticity. So if you have a slightly more elastic demand for rented property and a slightly more elastic supply on the behalf of landlords, then you're going to get a bigger impact from a rent control. So if we put in a rent cap there, then there's a bigger increase in demand, more people wanting to rent, but a, a bigger fall off, if you like, in the supply of rented property made available. So you create an even bigger excess demand. So changing the elasticity can change your analysis and help you write a better answer. But developing the diagram, if the supply of rented property now contracts to Q1, there is excess demand. But of course, some people to get their hands on that rented property might be willing to pay a rent of R3. Actually, well above the free market rent, because they're desperate to rent, they might well be willing to pay R3. And that then allows you to think about consumer surplus. The difference between the rent people pay and the rent that some people will be willing and able to pay if, if those properties are, are in scarce supply. So this is a developed diagram. You could then label and shade different areas to show uh, what you're talking about. You might also develop it further. What happens, for example, if landlords decide to take homes off the market permanently? In other words, if they decide to stop converting uh, properties for rent and start just converting properties and selling them on the open market for purchase. So the supply of rented property could shift to the left from S1 to S2 if there's a, if you like, a permanent rent control which depresses the return on rented housing. If that's the case, at the maximum rent shown in the diagram there, the supply would fall to Q3. And now you've got an even bigger gap between the demand for rented property and the supply. So the right-hand diagram, can you see the difference between the right-hand diagram the left hand side lots of students just do the basics in the exam just dump a diagram into the answer which is okay but it's not going to get you the highest marks for analysis and of course a better diagram inevitably leads to stronger evaluation let's finish off this short video again i'll do another video with four more examples in a little while let's look at uh, the sugar tax as another topical example of how you can develop a diagram to get better marks so our sugar tax, uh, let's say we're putting a tax on the producers of high sugar drinks, the likes of Coca-Cola or Fanta or Iron Brew. Sports drinks, for example, with high sugar content. Here's our initial equilibrium, the supply pre-tax. Don't forget to ace your diagrams, the price of sugary drinks, the quantity, label the equilibrium points. And if we put a tax on producers, a specific tax in this case, a constant tax per unit, the supply curve shifts upwards by the tax, leading to an increase in the equilibrium price and a fall in the equilibrium quantity bought and sold. Now, this analysis diagram, this is the basic diagram 
showing the effect of attacks and will score some marks. But the point of this video is to say develop the diagram to get better marks in your exam. How can we develop it? Well, of course, the first thing we can do is we can show how much tax revenue the government gets. The tax per unit is the vertical distance P2, P3. So the consumer pays P2 after the tax. The producer then has to pay the tax to the government. Um, P3 is the price the producer keeps after the tax. And that distance, P2, P3, is the tax per unit. So you can then show uh, the tax total tax revenue, which is P2, A, B, P3. And if you wanted to go further, you can show that most of this tax is paid for by the consumer and a little bit is absorbed by the producer. Um, you could then develop your diagram by bringing consumer welfare into it. Now, this is a fail safe way to get higher marks on analysis and it helps the evaluation. So label key points on the diagram, which I've just done for you there. Uh, a, B, C and D and E are five label points. Consumer welfare, well, consumer surplus, the tax leads to a higher price for these drinks. So therefore, consumer surplus, the area underneath the demand curve and above the price, that goes down from C, P1, E to the area C, P2, A. A fall in consumer surplus as the tax leads to an increase in the price and a fall in quantity consumed. Producer surplus also falls from P1, E, D to P3 BD. So a tax leads to a loss of producer and consumer surplus. Of course, it also creates some tax revenue as well. Total tax revenue in this case, tax per unit times by quantity is area P2 A B P3. Now, what's the point here? The point is if you develop your diagram, if you develop your diagram, there's more to talk about. And of course, one of the key aspects of the evaluation flows from your analysis. If you're showing the tax revenue going to the government, shaded in green here, the evaluation could be how the tax revenue is used. Is it used to fund better food nutrition in schools? Is it used to fund primary school sports or community sports clubs? Is it used to fund information education campaigns? Who knows? But the revenue could be used in a socially productive, socially beneficial way. That's part of your evaluation. Of course, it goes back to showing this in the diagram. That's what I would call a developed diagram. Of course, you could change the elasticities if you wanted to in a separate diagram, but this is the kind of analysis diagram we're looking to see from students. You could also have used, for example, an externalities market failure diagram as well. And I'll do some externalities diagrams in the second video on how to develop your pieces. There we go, four examples of how you can go from a basic diagram and develop it in some way the strong message we're getting from the examiners across different boards is they want students to write, to draw better diagrams, uh, cleaner, more accurate diagrams, but also to develop them to get to the highest analysis marks. And hopefully this video has been a little help, helpful step in that direction. Okay, thank you.